Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. September 16th, and here we are. And days are getting shorter, getting darker sooner. Back to a time where it's dark during our service. And I know many of us are going through some darkness now, and so I wanted to speak tonight about finding faith when you're freaking out, maybe you're freaking out, maybe you're not. I find myself freaking out sometimes when I watch the news and there's um, everything, everything, right? Global pandemic, wildfires and riots, there's an election like... Uh, um, I don't know, I guess I was thinking COVID and fires and riots, oh my! Let's uh, just feel like Dorothy on my way, I'm traveling down the yellow brick road and on my way home and there's another thing and another thing. Let's keep keeping on that road. Um, our, our country's on fire and 10 states that I heard 10 states, 4.4 million acres that have been devastated by fire. Um, we're having these problems breathing, COVID-19, this uh, smoke is traveling from California, Oregon, over the country. And we're seeing evidence of the smoke in New York and D.C., and even in Canada. What is going on with us? I think about it as our collective experience as we face a threat to our ability to breathe. So I've been thinking about the breath, and I looked up uh, in the revealing word what Charles Fillmore had to say metaphysically about breath, and said breath is the inner life flow that pulsates through the whole being. The breathing of the manifest man, she means humankind or people, corresponds to the inspiration of the spiritual man or person. Uh, when any man is inspired with high ideas, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Um, so I'm thinking about are we breathing in the breath of the limited, smoky, negative stress? Are we breathing in the free, clean air of spirit? Well, we always have that choice of how we nourish our spirits. What do you do when your house is on fire? People are evacuating. Is your spiritual house on fire? I don't know. Is our collective spiritual house on fire? Well, what's burning up in you? Is there something that's burning up in you? Having faith when you're freaking out call, calls on us to dig deep. To dig deep, because that's when it's not easy. That's when the world's on fire. And what do we do? Uh, what's the next step and the next step? I look to one of my spiritual teachers, a Unity co-founder, Myrtle Fillmore. It's a wonderful book called How to Let God Help You, and it's filled with essays and different uh, talks she gave, different writings that were compiled together into this book. And she had this one chapter, uh, it's... It's called Meeting the Cloven Hoof. 
<laughs> thought we don't really use that kind of the language anymore, but uh, I knew what she was talking about. She was talking about finding faith when you're freaking out. She didn't use those words back then. And she said, count it all joy. <laughs> so it's like, oh, Myrtle, count it all joy. Okay, so how do I count it all joy? Well, she says, because the spirit of good is doing some much needed house cleaning work. So if your house is on fire, maybe there are some things that need to be cleansed, to be cleaned out, to be released. And so, well, we can count it joy in knowing that as that which is no longer working, which is old habits, old thinking, old ways, is purified in the fire, that what is left is joy, is renewal, is transformation. And she shares in this teaching that when we commit to our spiritual life, when we commit to living a life where we express Christ consciousness, that any negativity that you hold in the cor any dark corner of your subconscious gets loosened up and freed, <coughs> excuse me, for you to realize, to examine, to, um, to free yourself of, to let go into the fire. When we first start on our spiritual journey, we may find ourselves uh, using a broom in order to kind of sweep up, is what Myrtle says, and that as we increase in our spiritual practice, in our meditative life, in our prayer life, in our affirmations, that we find that we can use a vacuum cleaner, <laughs> that we get better at moving that negativity and that kind of thinking through uh, in our lives. She tells a story of a person who has a house full of old, uncomfortable furniture. It's just not great furniture, maybe a bunch of hand-me-downs and broken stuff that never got fixed right, taped together. Maybe the, the cat got at some of that furniture, just looking really shabby. And that this person, suppose they receive new furniture. I think about how we have this furniture dealer here in Houston, where if the Astros win it all, you get your free furniture, or this person got the free furniture. <laughs> and so just imagining all this furniture showing up, and what would happen when the new furniture showed up? Well, you'd have to move the old stuff out, put it out on the curb, hope they pick it up when it's time for large trash pickup and that kind of thing, and your house is in disarray. I liked how Myrtle said that it's not um, in the apple pie order that it normally is in. I like that apple pie order. It's not an apple pie order anymore. It's a mess. That's what I see when I look at the news. Like, okay, it's not, we're not in apple pie order right now. And can we count it all joy? We know there's something good on the other side of this. Even in this, there is good. There is good. We can commit to see it when we commit to finding faith, when we're freaking out, right? When we align our consciousness with the spirit of truth within us, we are able to release those old furnishings and bring in the new and have the new order and the new life, but there's this time of processing and shifting that happens that can be really uncomfortable and your house might not look the way you want it to for a while. So if we're creating the new earth, how does the old one pass away? How do we release the old one? How does your old life pass away? I think about when I sit to meditate, when I teach meditation to my students, and I tell them this, because this is my experience, that sometimes when your mind 
is about to get really quiet, it gets really active first. <laughs> and all these thoughts start flooding in, and that's when you get frustrated, and you, don't, you, wanna, you feel like, I stink at meditating, and I'm just gonna stop meditating. And what I notice is that the mind gets really active, and then it gets really quiet. It gets really quiet. So I can see that as, for me, I go, okay, my mind's getting really active. I'm going to stay with it. I stay with my affirmation if I'm using an affirmation or mantra. Stay with that or just noticing, simply noticing the busyness of the mind. It really wants my attention. And being present with it, try not to follow the thoughts or just noticing the thoughts, noticing, noticing. And the mind starts relaxing. It's like when I put in my contact, I'm waiting for my new contacts to come in there, so I kept my glasses on today. Uh, and <laughs> I'm still getting used to putting contacts on. And when I put the contact on, the muscles of my eye are like, mm, <laughs> do not want the contact. They're foreign object, foreign object. And then it, after enough tries, and my eyes get used to being poked for a while, Finally, I'm able to get the contact in because it just gives up. It just gives up. Yeah. So letting the old life pass away, being willing to let go of all that no longer serves, all that is not us, all of the masks, the personas, the tactics, all the ways that we were or have been to be our authentic self to live our truth, who we really are. Merle said, we understand hell to be a purifying process which the soul goes through to rid it of dross and weakness. So the hell, the fires, releasing the dross. The word hell comes from the word uh, Gehenna, which was uh, the city, the place where the city incinerator was in the valley outside of Jerusalem where they burned the garbage. So this was a healthy measure actually to take the garbage out of the city and to burn it, to release it. So this is a good, good, good thing. It was a good thing for the city not to have garbage around. It's good for our consciousness not to be sitting around in the garbage of negative thinking. She says, we feel that the scripture writers were trying to make clear to us the way in which the purifying fire of spirit continues its work in us until we come forth free from all that does not measure up to the Christ standard. So, I believe that as we continue to commit to this path, our spiritual life, that all that is not our true nature, our authentic nature, our Christ nature, shows up for us to heal. Oh, there it is to heal. That is that thing. There's that person to forgive. There's that situation. Until we get it and we release it or forgive or whatever we need to do to put it into the fire and let it go. What is it that makes you go through hell so often? And why does each trip seem worse than the last? Myrtle <laughs> says, why so often? And why each trip worse than the last? Well, she shares with us that purgatory is a condition of our soul that is not something that God puts us through. It's not a punishment. It's our, our own soul's process. And um, it's, she says it's not necessary to go through purgatory once you've released all that's in your subconscious that's not in alignment of tr with truth. So as you continue to heal, do your healing work, that that experience of going through hell, you recognize this is optional. I can have this experience, I can see what's happening outside of myself, um, I can feel compassion, I can pray, I can 
you know, do what my work is. I don't have to make myself go through the suffering and the hell and the torture of it. I had the, the blessing to do a call to calm meditation this morning with Panash Desai, and what a beautiful soul he is. And he did this meditation and he talked about clearing the lenses uh, from your past with Windex, the lens of how your parents saw you, the lens of how your teachers saw you, the lens of relationships, people, what they, who they told you to be, or who they, how they saw you, and then you took that on as your truth of who you are, and then you began to behave that way, like you're uh, you know, a bad child, and oh, well, if my dad says that, or my teacher says that, then I must be bad, and then the behavior, you take it on, or you feel shame, or whatever, that behavior, and he says to, put Windex on those, that if we clear all that up, all those projections, all the lenses, all the things we took in, what's left is who we really are, our authentic self. So this is that releasing of what it is that is wanting to be healed, our house on fire, burning it down to the embers, right? What is left is, is pure being. So the good news is you can end the freaking out now, if you want to, or you could keep freaking out. <laughs> it's up to you. But you can end it now, and Myrtle gives us this formula. She says, stop believing these undesirable states of mind are true. So we keep thinking these thoughts of fear or lack or worry and or things that people told us about ourselves and the problem is we think it's true so we keep believing it and then we follow it so just stop believing that all that is true know the truth from within you right know the truth from within you make up your mind that you're not going to stand one more minute of listening to that kind of harmful thinking that you're just not going to allow yourself that kind of hell or abuse that you can hear what's out there, know what's going on, and not allow yourself to suffer and struggle through it. And then she says third, so stop believing that the states of mind are true, make up your mind you're not going to stand for them a moment longer, and then watch your thoughts, your attitudes, your acts to see that you don't invite in undesirable state. So if you're walking around like a grump and you're looking for problems, you're going to find them. And she says, the thing is, is that we don't walk around thinking I want bad things to happen to me or I want to find out bad news or I'm trying to cause people a bad day necessarily, but that sometimes we can unconsciously invite them in or they wouldn't be there at all if we didn't at some level of our thinking invite them in. So finding faith means standing in your power. Standing in your power, and I love that because I guess I think of Myrtle Fillmore as being like so refined and demure and just prim and proper. And she said this, should one always be sweet and forgiving? Yes, but not necessarily soft and without backbone and individual conviction. Like, Stand in your power. You don't have to just do whatever pleases everybody else just so that they're happy, and then you harbor resentment. She says, forgiveness is not silent consent. The negative appearance of making the best of a situation while underneath there is resentment, that you're just going along with it, but you're resenting it. That's not, not forgiveness not being authentic and free and in faith, even in faith, to just uh, trying to please everybody and never, and never being true to yourself, which is how we form all of these false um, ways of being or ways that don't, that don't serve us. They're just uh, 
lesser than the full, beautiful, whole and perfect nature that we all want. So some of the storms we experience come from putting up with people, not treating us with love and respect and the human dignity that we deserve. I always thought, thought it was interesting in, uh, in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, ver, uh, chapter 10, verse 34 to 36, that Jesus said, I do not, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. How did he know there was an election this year? <laughs> it's like, oh, that, that sounds very, um, very current in a lot of ways for many people and what I'm hearing from, um, from those in my life and the sensitivity around politics and what's up for everyone. Yeah, so there's that idea of the sword. I come not, they always thought of Jesus as the Prince of Peace. And here it is, it says, I, I come not to bring peace to the earth, I have uh, but a sword. And I come not to bring peace, but a sword. So there's that sword. And I see it as those boundaries that we have when someone is not treating us with respect, with love, with dignity, that we don't have to continue to endure that abuse in our lives. Spiritual path is not being a doormat. That we can know ourselves so well that we can say, yeah, that's enough and release that person, if necessary, from our lives. That's how I see that, coming into our authentic self, coming into our own power, not the self that others wanted you to be or tried to create you to be, but your true self. I want to finish with telling you a story about overcoming fear, one of my favorites. And it is from the Hebrew scriptures, wonderful story that, um, about a shepherd named David. And what was cool about David, and we've got a David here who's a singer, <laughs> that David sang psalms. I love to hear the songs all sung. I've heard this one sung, Psalm 23. And he says, I will fear not evil for thou art with me, or I will fear no evil for you are with me. And David sang this out of such a deep sense of conviction of his faith, even when he could have been freaking out, that he developed this deep faith. And this faith began when he was a shepherd. As a boy, he tended the sheep and... The sheep often, they were often prey. The sheep did not defend themselves very well. That's why they needed a shepherd. So lions would come for the sheep. Wolves would come for the sheep. And David became very adept at using his sling and shooting stones at these lions and wolves to keep them away from his precious sheep. And so he'd been doing this for years, protecting the sheep. And so one day, there came a great threat to his people, the Israelites. They were being attacked by the Philistines, and this was not anything different at one army against an army. But what was really a freak-out moment was there was this giant, this huge, huge man, Goliath, who was so much bigger than anybody who had ever showed up. And Goliath said he wanted to, one person from the Israelite army. Send me one person and I'll just fight. And uh, just, just one to one. And here's David, this boy shepherd, 
And over the years, he had developed this deep faith in his ability to protect his flock of sheep, while here is his flock, his people. He wanted to protect his people now, and something within him gave him the courage to step up against this giant. And he got before the giant. Uh, he got before this giant. So before I tell you the rest of the story, is there a giant for you? What is that giant for you? A problem that's so big that no one seems to know. It seems unsolvable. It just seems unsolvable. This big giant. Person, situation. David saw this giant. It could represent any, any big situation in your life. Uh, could name them, but you, you know what's going on with you. We all have our things that we can freak out about. And David saw the giant, and he knew he had to face them. And he said to the giant, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin. This giant was all, had all armor and all, all these weapons. He was massive and also well-armed. He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So here's the key here, that he faces this giant deep in an awareness of God as his source calling for the name of God in the face of this fear, this big, huge fear. And the giant saw him, and he had no... David, here's this boy, he had no armor, and he just had a sling, and the giant laughed at him. He was like, really? And as the giant was laughing and mocking him and um, thinking this was ridiculous, David slung a stone... And he hit the giant just like he had been targeting these wolves and lions who'd been attacking his sheep. He was able to harness that, those skills and that faith that he had grown in his ability to hit a mark. And he hit the giant right in the center of the forehead. The giant fell. And then, the, as the story goes, he took the sword and he decapitated the giant and the head metaphysically representing the intellect that we hold in our mind, this big, big fear. It's not the truth. We cut that off. And then there's, there's, um, you know, there's the celebration that that has been Move past that. So why was David able to do what a whole army couldn't do, this, this young boy? Well, David had brought his faith to the small things. He had built up his skills, and he was fearless using the power of God within him. So we know that each of us is facing unusual circumstances, unprecedented, unprecedented times where there are things to call forth our prayers and our concerns, and there can be some real imminent danger that we can see and be facing depending where we are and what we're doing at any given time. And as we walk on the Christ path, the false of ourselves, that which is not true, when we choose not to try to cheat and have schemes and do all kinds of old ways, when that all falls away and we're just purely our authentic self, we are a light that stands in the darkness. We become aware of the truth of the one presence and the one power, which is God, which is always true in and through any circumstances, no matter the appearance. I want to close by sharing with you an affirmation from Myrtle Fillmore. I invite you to say it with me where you are. Repeat after me. I cannot be afraid. For God is omnipresent good. 
God is omnipresent protection. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Breathe that in. Feel the truth of that in your heart, in your oneness with God. Thank you, God. And so it is. Amen. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.